your dreams with Thanksgiving. We will need to your point to pay. For this is the day you have made and we rejoice. We will need to your dreams with Thanksgiving. We will need to your point to pay. For this is the day you have made me joy. Bring our song before you to magnify and praise you. Because of your son, we can know your love. Your faithfulness and mercy are great and everlasting. Out of hearts filled with praise all of our days. Let the reaching of the Lord all say we will enter your gates with thanksgiving. We will enter your courts with praise. For this is the day you have made and we rejoice. We will enter your gates with thanksgiving. We will enter your courts with praise. For this is the day you have made me rejoice. In our troubles, Lord, you hear us. You rescue and redeem us. Because you are here, we will never fear. You are the God of all creation, a strength and a salvation. Your goodness and grace is worthy of praise. Let the reaching of the Lord all sing. We will enter your place with thanksgiving. We will enter your court with praise. For this is the day you have made and we rejoice. We will enter your place with thanksgiving. We will enter your court with praise. For this is the day you have made me joy. Oh, our hearts overflow with the praise that we bring. You are our Lord and our God. You are the King of all kings. Yes, our hearts overflow with the praise that we bring. You are our Lord and our God. You are the King of all kings. The King of all kings. We will enter your place with thanksgiving. We will enter your court to praise. For this is the day you have made and we rejoice. We will enter your courts of praise, for this is the day you have made me joy. For this is the day you have made me joy. For this is the day you have made me joy. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the 
Because he first loved us. God so loved the world that he gave us his only son. And what a privilege to rejoice in that together this morning. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. 
For Jesus is waiting there with open arms. See His open arms for God so loved the world that we gave us. His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated. Now it is well. I'm walking in freedom for God so loved. God so loved the world. Praise God. Praise God. From whom all blessings flow. Praise Him. Praise Him for the wonders of His love. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings go. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. For His amazing love, for God. The world that He gave us is one and only Son to save us. For God so loved the world that He gave us is one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. The power of hell. Forever defeated, now it is well. I'm walking in freedom for God so loved, for God so loved the world. God so loved the Just wishing, I know I'm praying to 
you are God who listens, and I know He hears me, and I know He's living. Yes, I am praying to a God who listens, who knows me, who loves me, who never will fail me, who tells me that I am His own, and you surround me, remind me. You always for me, so I come boldly to your throne. I'm not just hoping, I'm not just wishing, yes, I am praying to a God who listens. Oh, what a promise that we've been given, yes, we are praying. To a God who listens. Love that saves the lost and wearied soul, making soft the heart of stone, and life once broken is now made whole. There is no greater love, there is no greater love than this. Love that cleans my sick and sinful heart, and by His blood forgiveness bought. Night and light. Where once was dark, there is no greater love, there is no greater love than this. There is no greater love, there is no greater grace, but no other name can rescue you from the grave forever. With a greater love, there is no greater love than this. The love that gives and never gives up, faithful to complete the work begun, steadfast, unfailing in all He does. There is no greater love, there is no greater love than this. There is no greater love, there is no greater grace, but no other name can rescue you from the grave. Forever I will praise the only one who saves. With a greater love, there is no greater love than this. Lord, show me how to love the world around me. With a selfless heart and grace abounding, that all may see, that all may know. No greater love is found, no truth is sure and sound, but the love of Jesus. Oh, it's love that helps me to see beyond the cross, to see and save the weak and the lost. With selfless trust, I bear my cross. There is no greater love, there is no greater love to give. There is no greater love, there is no greater grace, but no other name. 
And John Eldridge wrote a little book called Epic. And in it, he says, you know, one thing about life, it's not like a math problem. It's not something that you can solve if you have the right equation and put in the right numbers, you'll get the right answers. Instead, he said, we should look at life as a story. Waking up each day is like turning the page of the story of your life. We don't know what characters will make an appearance or what will happen, or how the plot will thicken. We don't know over a year's time how the chapter will end, whether it will be dramatic or funny or disastrous. We just have to live out our life one day at a time and be ready for the story to unfold. Fortunately, he said, regardless of how our story turns out on any given day, month, or year, we can read ahead and see how our story of our life turns out in the end. We were born into a story that God is telling and the most dramatic story in history, an epic of godlike proportions. We have a part to play in God's story of the ages, and it's our calling to find our part of the play and play our part to the fullest. Our life is a story. <laughs> Some of the story we share. I mean, there are certain things that we share, obviously, you know, COVID and global warming and the economy and all that. But most of our story is uniquely ours. Every single one of us. The Bible uses several metaphors about what life is. It's interesting. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says it's a race. We're all, we're all in this race together. And the key to the race is not how fast you run, but how many times you get up. Paul said that it's a war, that we find ourselves in spiritual war, in a spiritual war, and we have to put on gospel armor to be able to deal with it. He also said that our life's like a boxing match, and we have to discipline ourselves like a boxer. But the most common metaphor in the Bible for our lives, it's a journey. You see it over and over again. Just think of how many times in the Old Testament you read the word path. We're on a journey. <laughs> and I think most Christians are aware of that. I think most Christians know where their spiritual journey began. When they became believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, were born again into the family of God. And they're grateful for that. And I think that most Christians know that they're heaven bound for all eternity. And they're hopeful about that. But I don't think most Christians spend enough time talking about where they are in their journey today. What is going on in my spiritual journey today? So I want to look at our spiritual journey this morning. And I want to begin in Matthew chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount, verse 13. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. And by the way, I don't know of any words that are more sobering in the Bible than these. 
these words are disturbing to me. Uh, and they come directly from the Lord's mouth. Here's what Jesus says. He says in verse 13, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. But the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are a few who find it. Wow. Do you know who he's speaking to? Israel. A little dot in the whole world. There's this little dot at the end of the Mediterranean. And he's speaking to them and he tells them, almost all of you are on the Broadway. There's only a few of you who will find life. That's not popular today at all. People don't like that in America. We don't believe that at all. <laughs> We're a different kind of culture. Listen as I read from Proverbs chapter 14 for just a moment. Verse 12, there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Well, that's America. That's the world we live in. Everyone says that. See, when you look at the words of Jesus in our country, they're just not going to believe it at all. I mean, there are people that say, look, fair is fair. That's the way it's going to be. God will grade us all on the curve. And except for the worst of us, all the rest of us are in. And we all think that way. I've said this, and I don't mean it to be facetious. I just mean it to be an observation. I am amazed that every person virtually I've ever known, say, in this church, who had any relative or loved one ever die, every one of them is in heaven. Every one of them made it. Now, Jesus say only a few find it, and most people never do, but everybody's going. I was just talking to my brother, and he was talking about a neighbor of his who I knew well who had died at 95. And uh, he said, I was talking to the the man's daughter, and she said, you know, it's good, though, because he's in a better place. We all say that because we all want to say that. And so what a lot of us end up talking about is, look, God will grade us on the curve, and as long as I'm not terrible, he has to let us in. Does that sound like what Jesus is saying? We also live in a pluralistic society, a society that believes, look, if you want to believe in stuff, go ahead. But let me tell you something. Every single spiritual road leads to the same God. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what you believe. It only matters that you believe. And whatever you believe in, that sends you to God. So almost everybody is going there. Hmm. There are some people that are universalist. And they do believe that every single person who ever lived will be in heaven. And when I see the words of Jesus, it's like, this doesn't seem to ring true. Like, he doesn't seem to get it. And there are other people who say, there is no God, so I don't have a thing to worry about anyway. But what he says there is kind of an amazing thing. Turn with me to Proverbs 4 for a moment. Proverbs chapter 4. Talking about how this journey begins. Jesus is saying, your journey is going to begin with which path you take. It's up to you. One is broad. Almost everybody's on it. The other is narrow. Only a few find it. He said, that's the way this works. So we get to Proverbs chapter 4. And here what we see is, starting in verse 11... Solomon speaking, and he said, I have directed you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in the upright paths. When you walk, your steps will not be impeded. And if you run, you will not stumble. Take hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not proceed in the way of evil men. Solomon takes the next step. He just says, look, son, if you live life with wisdom, you're going to prosper. It's going to be a good life. But if you don't, you won't. 
please don't get on the broad way with the evil men. Please don't do that. Verse 18, he says, but the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. Verse 20, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ears to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their body. Watch over your heart with all diligence. For he says, for from it flows the springs of life. The last two, three verses, 25 to 27, let your eyes look directly ahead. Let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Watch the path of your feet, and all your ways will be established. Do not turn to the right nor the left. Turn your foot from evil. What's he describing? Do you want to have a great life? Do you want to have a great life? He said you have to take the right journey. You have to be on the right path. If you want to have a great life, Jesus said you have to choose the right path. Solomon says you have to take the right path. <laughs> Jesus called this in the New Testament the abundant life. When Jesus came and said, I've come to give you life and give it to you abundantly, he's not talking about going to heaven. That's great, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about your journey now. I want to give you a great life. I want you to give you abundant life. And as we read the rest of the New Testament, you're aware this is a life that's filled with peace and joy and hope. And it doesn't matter what your circumstances are. You're going to have a life of peace and joy and hope. He said, I'll give you that. Wow. That's kind of interesting. I don't know about you, but for me it has been that. It's been a life of joy. I've lived long enough to be able to look back over it now. It's been a life of joy. My prayer is that everyone should have a life of joy. Especially every child of God should have a life of joy. Jesus said, I'll give it to you. Solomon said, there's a way to have it. And yet so many of us don't. And it's interesting. Instead of talking about apparently we're not tapping into the resource of God we end up saying, no, no, you don't understand. I'm a victim of circumstances. And I bet you are in many ways. But God is greater than circumstances. There's a Scottish pastor named Sinclair Ferguson. And for many, many years, he ended every single sermon with the same phrase. Isn't it wonderful to be a Christian? You know, that's an interesting thought. Every sermon for years, isn't it wonderful to be a Christian? Maybe they eventually got it. It is wonderful to be a Christian. <laughs> but your journey begins on the basis of which path you take. And there are so many different ways to do this. David Jeremiah tells the story of Dr. Francis Collins. Uh, Dr. Francis Collins is the director of the National Institute of Health. Uh, he is one of the most highly respected physicians in the country. And he sat down with uh, Peter Warner of The Atlantic for an interview. And he explains to Peter Warner that when I was a medical student, he said, I was an atheist. That's the way I lived my life. And he said, the turning point for me came uh, when I was attached to a patient that reminded me in our conversations of uh, my need. In fact, the woman reminded me of my grandmother. And she was suffering from an advanced cardiac disease, which included almost everyday episodes of unbelievable extreme pain. And yet she came through this all with a remarkable peace, and she was comfortable sharing the reasons with, the, with me, she, he said. She would often tell me that the reason I got through it was that because Jesus lives in my heart. And at one point, after one of those sharing moments, she looked at me sort of in a quizzical way and said, you know, doctor, you listen to me to talk about my faith, but you never say anything. What do you believe? He said, that direct, simple question was like a thunderclap to me. The most important, he said, question I've ever been asked, what do you believe? And I thought about it. He said, later... I met a pastor who introduced me to C.S. Lewis. He said, I began to read C.S. Lewis's writing, uh, who was an Oxford scholar and at one time had been a practicing atheist himself. And as he said, uh, he, as in he watched God and through the writings of C.S. Lewis in his life, he became a Christian. 
He eventually found at age 27 years of age, Jesus Christ, and he said, it changed everything in my life. It's a choice. He was on a broad path. He went the narrow way. <laughs> Your journey begins with which path you choose to take. The second thing, something we don't take kindly to either. Your journey will take you through difficult circumstances. I promise. Your journey will take you through difficult circumstances. Go with me to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. The last verse, verse 33. Now, if it's in John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, what do we know? Night before the crucifixion. Jesus is jamming everything he can into his disciples' brains. Everything that he thinks is important, he's given them the last three and a half years together, and now he's just pushing everything you need to know. And so in verse 33, he says this, These things I have spoken to you, so that in me, now watch, you may have peace. Now, who doesn't like that? Right? Hey, I have peace in Jesus. Uh, watch, though. In the world, you have tribulation. Take courage. I've overcome the world. In me, you're going to have peace. What are you going to get in the world? Here's his promise. Tribulation. That's a word, thlipsis, and it means affliction, anguish, and trouble. Sound like your life? He said, yeah, I promise you, you're going to have that. Circumstances of life can going to be at times in your life extraordinarily difficult. You have the choice. Do I live in the tribulation or do I live in the peace? Now look at chapter 17, just across the page, verse 13. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. So he just said, you want to have peace? I've got that. You want to have joy. I got that too, by the way. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. And your word, he said, is truth. Down to verse 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who believe in me through their word. That's us. Wow. What do you get in the world? Hatred. What do you get in the Lord? Joy. Interesting. Interesting. So as we go through these difficult circumstances, I can have tribulation and hatred, or I can have peace and joy. Wow. He said, there's not much you can really do about that. That's just the way this world works. You see, do you think about it that way? Almost always, and I've used this metaphor before, if I ask all of you to take an exam and tell me, do you believe there is tragedy and suffering in the world? 100% of you would say what? Yep, yep. And then it rings your doorbell. I can't believe this happened. Why'd this happen to me? We do this all the time. I, I just can't believe it. Why, why wouldn't God do something? Hmm. He has bigger fish to fry. You see, the first point I had was your journey begins when it, which uh, path you decide to take, and your journey will take you through difficult circumstances. The next point is your journey is a process. Now, what's the wording that can change you? I didn't say will. I know there are Christians that are obstinate enough that they could stay the same for 30 years. They could be bitter and victimized, and 30 years later, they're bitter and victimized. But the journey's designed that it can change you. That's his point. You see down in verse 17 that I just read, 17, 17, he said, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Now, sanctify is a religious word, and sometimes we struggle with religious words. This is easy. 
set them apart. Set them apart in the truth. Your word is truth. You see, how do I go through these difficult times and these circumstances? How do I deal with all this stuff in my life? He said, that's what the word does. You see, how, how do I appropriate the peace of Christ and the joy of Christ? That's what the word does. You see, why am I not shocked when suffering rings my doorbell? That's what the word does. You see, over and over again, he says, that's going to be the key. Hmm. As our lives are filled with all of this, he said, when you get the right perspective from the word of God, it can change you. To show you how the change works, go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Corinthians. I'll actually go just a little bit higher to, to give you a context to this. He's talking about glory. Uh, glory is such a great word. You know, glory to the Lord, the glory of the Lord. You know, my favorite definition of glory is uh, Tony Evans had my favorite. I heard it. 30 years ago, you know, he said, God's glory is just God showing off. I just love that. You want to know what I'm like? Look what I created. It's my glory. No one can do what I do. He said, so this is interesting. You remember the story of Moses? You know, Moses is getting always up in the mountain by himself, and he begs God, and he says to God, you know, just let me see you. God said, no, you really can't. He said, but if I push you back in this cliff area and I walk past you, you can see my backside. So Moses gets in there and God walks past him. Then Moses comes out and said, wow, that was a great experience. And then I imagine if he didn't notice, by the time he met the first person, they said, Moses, you're glowing. What do you mean? You're glowing. There's something coming off of you. You just saw the backside of God and you're glowing. <laughs> it's interesting. Now, here's what he says then. He says in verse 13, and not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. See, Moses liked it. In the beginning, there's no veil. Hey, how you doing? You know, he's glowing. Then he keeps looking in the mirror. I think the glow is going. So then he says, I'll put a veil over thinking that way they'll think I'm protecting them, but not really. Really, I'm protecting me. I've lost the glow. You see, I've lost the glow. You put a veil on. You see, that's his point. So he goes on and says, their minds were hardened. And he said, and for until this day at the reading of the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. That veil that separated him from God still separates him. He's talking about Israel. He said, but to this day, whenever Moses is read, the veil lies over their heart. Another metaphor. They don't see it. He says, but whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. That's the narrow gate. That's you and me. He then says this, now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, no veils for us, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. There's a picture of your life. Wow. As I look into the mirror, as I look into the God's Word, it's transforming me. Slowly but surely, just the opposite. Moses' transformation physically was declining. My spiritual transformation is growing. That's what he says is happening here. Wow. What, a, what an interesting and great thing to be able to say. Hmm. Have you noticed that in your life? I have. I've seen what God's done. Sometimes I'm amazed. And, and sometimes, by the way, I don't mean it in how, where I'm at, like, ha, ha, ha. I mean how disappointing I was. Like, I, I just realized that. 
I could see that I've grown, but I thought, what, what were you thinking? What are you doing? It was after I went through the gate, but I just, but the Lord's been faithful to all this. Hmm. It's interesting. And I think, what causes this? What causes us to go from glory to glory to glory and grow? For me, it's just three words Jesus said. Abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me and I abide in you, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can't do anything. I even take it close. Whenever I find myself struggling, I don't try to get more willpower. I need to do better. I need to be more disciplined. The words that come in my head, whispered, I believe, by the Spirit of God to me is, stay close. Just stay close. You see, that's what Jesus is telling us all along. I'm not on my journey by myself, and neither are you. I'm right with you. You see, you're not on a journey by yourself. You're on a journey with the Lord. The only way you and, ever, and I can ever get in trouble is to not stay close. It's not a matter of rules or disciplines or all kinds of external things like that. It's a very spiritual thing. And when I stay close... It helps. It changes me. And the circumstances of suffering play a big role in that. You know, there's a verse I've never truly understood, but I do believe. Hebrews 4.8. Although he was a son, this is Jesus, he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. You ever read that verse? If Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered, what about me? You see, suffering is not the enemy of the Christian. Suffering can be a friend of the Christian. When you read the New Testament, you almost get this idea that somehow God believes that suffering is a privilege. Why? It makes me want to stay close. It makes me want to abide. It takes away all my other options except him. And if you've ever been there in your life, oh, Lord, all I have and this is you, that's a moment to grow in. That's a great lesson to learn. <laughs> your journey begins with which path you choose to take. Your journey will take you through difficult circumstances. Your journey is a process that can change you. And lastly, your journey will take you to an absolutely sure destination. Go with me to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5. This is what Paul writes. He said, we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, what do we call that? That's death. We know that if we die, he said, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan, no kidding, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Can't wait for a resurrected body. See, can't wait. You know, as you get older, you, you get more anticipatory. <laughs> you know, I love Paul's words. The outer man is decaying and the inner man is being renewed. You stick around this earth long enough and you'll know what the outer man is decaying is. It happens. <laughs> He said, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we were at home in the body, we were absent from the Lord, we walked by faith, but not by sight. He said, we are of good courage, and I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and be at home with the Lord. That's the word of God. Absent from the body, at home with the Lord. Our culture doesn't see things like that. That moment, that moment that I'm absent from the body, 
is the moment I'm present with the Lord. I've said it in the past, but I think only an eight-year-old boy at Christmas morning could know what that feels like. There's a magic about that when you're little. Look at this. It's under the, that bike's under the tree. Look at that. That's kind of the way this is going to happen. One more passage. Revelation 21, right at the end of your Bible. Revelation 21, verse 4. When you find yourself suffering and difficult, struggling with pain, these are verses you should always read. It won't last. He will wipe away every tear from your eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And he said, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. Huh. No tears, no death, no mourning, no crying, no pain, all things new. And he said, by the way, the words I just said are faithful and true. Sometimes that's all we have to hold on to in this life. But these are words that we should. We should think about that. Your journey will take, place, take you to an absolutely secure place. Bob Goff is a, a writer and a bestseller in New York Times. Uh, he calls himself a recovering lawyer. And uh, I think that's an interesting way to put it. But he said ever since Bob Goff was a kid, he wanted to sail across the Pacific Ocean to Hawaii. Ever since he was a kid, I want to sail California to Hawaii. So a few years ago, Bob and a couple of his buddies entered the Transpac race. It's a race from L.A. to Hawaii. And it, have, it occurs every other year. With limited experience, Bob and his friends filled their 35-foot yet sailboat with canned chili and bottled water, and they set sail for Hawaii. Two weeks later, they arrived and experienced an extraordinary conclusion of their journey. And here's how he tells the story. There's a tradition, he said, in the Transpac race that no matter where you finish in the race, even if you finish at 2 o'clock in the morning, when you pull into the Ala Moana Marina in Oahu, there's a guy who announces the name of the boat and names every crew member who made the trip. And just when we came to the end of our supplies, we sailed across the finish line off Diamond Head and into the marina. It was a few hours before dawn. It had been 16 days since we left out from LA and our little boat, uh, knowing very little about navigation. Suddenly the silence was bro broken by a booming voice over the loudspeaker announcing the name of our tiny boat. Then the announcer started naming the names of our ragtag crew, like he was introducing heads of state. And when he came to my name, he didn't talk about how many navigational skills I had lacking or I, how I navigated a zigzag course all the way to Hawaii, or I wasn't even sure at times which way was north. He didn't tell everyone that I don't know really what I was doing and all the mess ups I made. Instead, he just welcomed me from the adventure like a proud father. When he was done, there was a pause, and then a sincere voice came across the loudspeaker to the entire crew. And this is what the voice said. Friends, it's been a long trip. Welcome home. He said, because of the way he said it, we all welled up and fought back tears. I wiped my eyes, and I reflected for a moment, he said. But none of that mattered because we had completed the race. I always thought of heaven would be a lot of a similar experience. After we cross the finish line of our lives, I imagine we'll be like floating into the Hawaiian marina when our names are announced. And one by one at the end of our lives, after so many mistakes, so many mid-course corrections, our lovingly heavenly Father will supply uh, and simply say to all of us, friends, it's been a long trip. Welcome home. Hmm. 
we all take a journey, and we call it life. I pray for anybody that you make the right choice in the beginning. I know broad is the way that leads to the destruction. I know there's a way that seems right to a man, but it ends in death. I pray you enter by the narrow gate. The journey is worth taking. It has the possibilities of creating a wonderful life for you. Realize that our journey does include difficult circumstances. And that the journey is designed to change you for the better, to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. And it's a journey that you never take alone. Not ever. Not a day. God has decided to be with you all the way through his spirit in your life. And he will stay with you all the way until you get home. Let's pray. Father, I pray this is a simple reminder. Our life's a journey. We all have a story to tell. And you are very much aware of every step of it along the way. It's all of your doing. It's grace. It's supernatural. And we are grateful for what you've done for us. You not only saved us, but you stay with us. And as we live on a cursed planet with all this pain and all this suffering, you allow it to rain on the just and the unjust alike, but you are with us. We can use these circumstances to make ourselves even more dependent and closer to you. And as we do, Father, we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the surety of heaven. Thank you for telling us very little about heaven. Simply that it's wonderful. You have told us so much more about life. How we live day in and day out. The kind of people we should be. The kind of disciplines we should have. The kind of neighbors that we are. The kind of spouses. The kind of children. The kind of parents. The kind of workers. You help us in every aspect of life through your word. And if we abide in your word, your word can set us apart, sanctify each and every one of us. Father, thank you for the journey. In Jesus' name, amen.
our story in Christ. Amen. 